Welcome to Hidden Figures, Understanding TV Audiences in the On-Demand Age. My name is Benoria Ravindran and I'm International Editor for Variety based out of London. Um, so in this session, we're going to hear from various broadcasters, producers uh, about the need for accurate data about on-demand um, viewership and also hear from Barb. Um, we have Justin Sampson, CEO, here with us, um, who which obviously Barb oversees and delivers audience measurement uh, for TV in the UK and is hugely important um, and is innovating as well. So we'll hear all, all about that and then we'll get into a little bit of a discussion about some of the latest developments and what it all means and contextualize it. Um, and to do that, we have a fantastic panel here with us. So thank you all so much for being in front of your computer screens on a beautiful day in London. Um, we have Lucy Bristow, who is Sky Media's Director of Insight and Research. Uh, Wayne Garvey, President of International Production for Sony Pictures uh, Television, which I should mention, Wayne, I know you love this, but um, which backs Left Bank which are producers of The Crown, which we will be, of course, discussing in this as well. Um, Sarah Rose, who is a Chief Operating uh, and Commercial Officer for Viacom CBS UK, uh, obviously owners of Channel 5. Um, and last but not least, Dustin Sampson, CEO of Barb, um, who is actually going to start um, the session off with a 10 minute, uh, very short 10 minute presentation uh, of what's new at Barb. Uh, and I will just over to you, Justin. Thanks, Minori. So for many years, viewers, as we know, have grown used to watching what they want when they want. And uh, analog and digital recording devices were pathfinders for a trend that is now increasingly fulfilled by streaming VOD services. And by international standards, I think it's fair to say UK broadcasters have led the way, investing for many years in streaming services that complement their linear channels. And these BVOD services have become destinations in their own right, while standalone subscription services such as Amazon, Prime Video, Disney Plus and Netflix have also found a place in the repertoire of viewers. And all of these VOD services can turn to in-house streaming data to understand the popularity of programmes, yet this source of data doesn't paint the whole picture. Streaming data are a reliable measure of how many devices tuned to a program, yet the data don't provide insight into how many people are watching and what kind of people are watching. And equally, streaming data can't report on how audiences on one VOD service are watching other streaming services. And, and Barb's audience measurement is designed to answer these types of questions and our transparent reporting of audiences creates industry-wide understanding about people's viewing behavior. And the insight from our data helps all businesses in the industry plan and account for their investment in making and distributing television programmes. Now, to meet this need, Barb has pioneered over the years many measurement uh, techniques to cover all forms of viewing, and VOD is no exception. I'd like to thank Steve Clark and the RTS for asking us to share our latest insight into TV audiences in the on-demand age. I'm going to highlight in these opening words what is already available for programmes on broadcaster-owned VOD services, and I'm going to preview some emerging uh, capabilities for reporting audiences to SVOD and video sharing services. Let's start with a couple of examples that are already part and parcel of our daily audience reporting. So It's a Sin um, premiered on Channel 4 on January the 22nd this year, with all five episodes being immediately available on all four. And here we can see the audience for episode five. And it's clear just how many people wanted to watch this before it featured in Channel 4's linear schedule on February the 19th. Four million people watched pre-broadcast with nearly 900,000 watching live and another just short of one and a half million watching in the four weeks after transmission. We can add color to this by showing which device people watched on. So for the pre-broadcast audience, just under 90% watched on a TV set with the balance split between PCs, tablets, and smartphones. Uh, not surprisingly, the live audience was almost entirely on the TV set. And then just under 10% of the post-broadcast audience watched on a PC, tablet, or a smartphone. So this 360 degree audience view helps program makers understand how people are choosing to watch their favorite television programs. And the reality is that behavior is not the same 
for all parts of the population. In this next example, we see the audience for the final episode of Normal People and how it builds from when it was first available on BBC iPlayer until four weeks after it was broadcast on BBC One. And we can see week by week the accumulation of the audience during this 64 day period. So after 35 days, 52% of the eventual audience has seen the programme and that jumps during the week of transmission to 90%. Now, if we look at this for young people, as suspected, they're much more likely to watch ahead of the linear schedule. So by the time of transmission, 72% of 16 to 34 year olds who watched this episode had already watched it. And that means the bump in viewing during the week of transmission is much less marked than the one we just and the one we can see for all aged four plus. So these two examples are a glimpse of the insight we're already delivering on how people are watching VOD programmes and they're possible because we have the cooperation of broadcasters to deliver this measurement. Historically, we've had more challenges when a service doesn't embrace the transparency of Barb's audience reporting. Back in uh, early 2017, we had an inquiry from Amazon about the possibility of measuring audiences to the grand tour and, and our answer was yes we can do that um, with, with Amazon's cooperation and we highlighted that as an industry currency the numbers would be published to all our subscribers and on that particular bombshell that conversation went cold. In light of this challenge Barb set out to measure audiences for Amazon and other SVOD services with or without their involvement and we're now on the verge of going live with our solutions. And I want to give you a sneak preview today. So in the middle of November last year, The Crown season four landed on Netflix. And here we can see how successful the launch was. The first episode attracted over 3.6 million viewers during the first seven days it was available on Netflix and ranked number eight compared to other shows first broadcast on November 15th. The second episode was just behind it in the rankings and all other episodes ranked between number 15 and number 31. Uh, down the bottom there, episodes nine and 10 were watched by around 1.4 million people, which points to just under 40% of viewers getting through the whole series in seven days. Now, this was during a lockdown, so we can't say with certainty whether this speed of getting through a whole series is, is normal or not. And we also know what type of people watch The Crown. These charts show two things. Firstly, on the left, you can see that women are more likely to watch than men, making up over 60% of the audience. And on the right, you can see it's particularly popular among 35 to 64 year olds who account for just short of 60% of the audience. Secondly, you can see the female profile becomes a bit more pronounced by episode 10 while there's a similar strengthening of the profile for 16 to 34 year olds. So this paints a picture of the viewers who are getting through the series more quickly are more likely to be women and younger. Another example is the second series of The Mandalorian on Disney Plus. The first episode launched on October 30th with a seven day consolidated audience of just under 2 million. Um, this is a, I think an impressive number when you consider the Barb's most recent date to show that subscription levels for Disney Plus are at about a quarter of Netflix's levels. And it's not surprising to see that The Mandalorian is more likely to attract younger male viewers. So we're looking here at how the show's profile compares with the total TV profile with gender on the left and age on the right. These are just two examples of our emerging capabilities for reporting SVOD content ratings and audience profiles. And when we launch the data, uh, our customers will be able to slice and dice the data in the same way we saw earlier for it to sin and normal people. And we're working with Kantar, our research contractor, to build up the library of available SVOD programs. And we're aiming to launch in late quarter three with a mix of archive and current material. Before wrapping up, let me share one more chart, which is an insight into overall viewing to SVOD and video sharing services. So this, going back to August last year, shows week by week the weekly reach of the four biggest services. And this is weekly reach on TV set. 
a couple of caveats to be aware of. Uh, seasonal factors are at play. Viewing is, as I think we all know, typically higher in the winter than the summer. And we have to bear in mind that the lockdown from January the 6th will also be having a, an effect. Taking Netflix first, it started this period back in August with a weekly reach of just over 25%. It topped 30% during November when the Crown launched. And during March, it was achieving a weekly reach of around one third of all people aged four plus. We can see YouTube is watched by, on a TV set by around one in five people. Although we know, not shown on this chart, that YouTube generates much larger audiences on smartphones, tablets and PCs than any broadcaster or SVOD service does. For Amazon Prime Video, the eye, I think, is drawn naturally to two spikes in its audience in December. These both coincide with Premier League match days when Amazon had the rights to live stream all the games. And Disney Plus shows steady, sustained growth over time. I highlight a slight bump in late February that coincides with its launch of star content on the platform. Again, this insight is part of an emerging capability barbell launch as part of our daily audience reporting towards the end of Q3. And I hope these insights set the scene for what I hope will be a very interesting conversation. And having finished these opening thoughts, I'll hand back to you, Minori. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. Can I just sort of ask as well, in terms of, in terms of kind of getting to this point, um, why has it taken sort of this long to, I guess, get to where you are in terms of measurement and having this more kind of holistic view, uh, specifically on the, the broadcaster side as well. Can you talk a little bit about the, the journey you guys have, have taken to sort of get here? Uh, there's two parts to the um, solving the, the challenges. One is technical and one is a willingness of services to be measured. And in terms of the technical part to the answer, we've, uh, we're now generating these data um, uh, on partly because we're installing in panel homes a, a, a meter that sits on the Wi-Fi router in, in the home. So in the past, we've put meters on the TV sets only, but the meter on the Wi-Fi router allows us to track levels of activity to uh, internet delivered services that, that aren't working with us. And, and to the last slide I showed those weekly reach figures, that's generated by the router meter. Now we're we haven't quite got it rolled out across the whole panel. We, we had hoped to by now, but the pandemic got in the way of our desired timings, but we expect to have that route to meet fully deployed by the summer, which will, which is an, an important part of solving the technical challenge. The second part, as I say, is the willingness of services to be measured. Channel 4, BBC, Sky, Viacom, ITV are all uh, collaborating with us to provide non-linear assets, uh, non-linear programs that we can, we can measure in the way that we've just shown. But when services don't choose to be collaborated, we, we need to come up with different solutions. And again, working with Kantar, we um, identified a solution for reporting the SVOD content uh, ratings of shows like The Crown, The Mandalorian, and we're making um, progress now to get that to become part of our daily reporting. So we have to crack the two parts, the, the technical part and how do we do the measurement when somebody doesn't want to be measured. And what can't you measure at this point? Um, uh, the, the, the developments we're putting in place this year will fill most of the capability gaps that we know the industry has been asking for. Um, we, we think there will still be a residual element of what we call unidentified viewing, which could, for example, include if, if people are watching via a satellite dish overseas satellite channels, that's not something we could do. Um, we, we've got a pretty good steer when a TV set's being used for gaming, but we, we can't be certain um, which games people are playing. That's not part of our remit. That's not on development we've 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 taken on so there are still a few things that we we, we need to try and find solutions for the, the other thing we need to do is to be able to say with certainty when a tv sets on and it's genuinely silent um because people are surfing the epg or maybe they're using the tv to 
showcase their favorite photos and at the moment we can't delineate that from from other types of usage so those are some of the things we we know we need to crack but but in terms of measuring content produced and distributed by broadcasters and SFOD services we're now very close to answering the industry's most asked question Wayne did you have a do you want to Yes, sorry, Justin, what about completion rates? How do you determine whether someone's, what, what, what's your, your take on that? Can you measure that or, or what? So the, the numbers that I've shared today are what we call average audience. So they're duration based metrics and they'll take into account people who've watched the whole show and people who've only watched part of it. And it's a fundamental part to all our reporting that we can um, actually measure the a length of time people spent and it, it it's not an analysis i've shared today but it is i believe something that that people do do with our data where they look at well what what part of the the audience watched the whole show and yeah. I, I think and that's something that sarah and lucy might be able to comment on more about the, the day-to-day use of our data certainly as a producer, that, that's one of the feedback you get from all the escort services mostly when they uh, decommission the series and don't pick up a second season, it's uh, completion rate wasn't quite good enough. And of course, you've got no way of knowing whether that's true or not. Um, Justin, I'm just wondering as well, just one final question in terms of, in terms of Barb. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll get to, to more later on as well, but um, how can we be confident that sort of some of the figures um, for the S ones that you discuss, obviously Netflix, Disney Plus, um, are accurate given given that they don't engage. Can you sort of give a word in terms of your methodology for for the streaming side of things? So we, we applied the kind of due diligence that Barb applies to any new measurement technique to satisfy ourselves that the data are accurate. Um, when Kantar comes forward with solutions, we will do laboratory testing. Um, so we will sit and spend half an hour watching a show on Netflix and say to Cantor, what do you think we've done? And they'll come back and they'll say, well, we think you did this. And if it's, so we, we do a lot of laboratory testing like that um, prior to going live with any solution. And um, it is a little bit more tricky when we don't have the involvement of the uh, SVOD um, and uh, video sharing platforms, although we have had some informal input from one of the SVOD services, which has been helpful in our conversation with Kantar to help them enhance the way the meter that's attached to the Wi-Fi router works so we can pick up um, uh, as much of the viewing to these services as we possibly can. Can you say so who? We're... That was Netflix, yeah. yeah. Um, so we're... We, we, we apply due diligence and the due diligence is one of the um, more time consuming elements of the process because we don't want to rush the data out before we're confident that it's worthy of having Barb's name attached to it. Got it, of course. Um, thank you so much for, for that and for um, getting, going to your presentation. Um, Lucy, I wanted to sort of turn to you in terms of, in terms of Sky and, and just wondering if you could sort of elaborate on obviously what we've, what we've seen in, in sort of uh, Barb's latest findings and the expansion in their reporting as well. Um, obviously, you'll have sort of inter internal data that that you guys use as well. But um, is this in line with with what you know what you're working against internally? Yeah, and um, I think that's a good point in terms of at, at Sky we have uh, a lot of our own data, a lot of our own download information and audience information. But I guess what Barb the, the gaps that Barb fills really for us is, is viewing at a more holistic level. Um, so in a lot of these data sets, it's quite hard to get into the real demographics that are watching, who's actually in front of the screen watching that piece of content. Um, and that's what the Barb technology does very well for us. So, so the two work very well in, in tandem really, having lots of our own volumes of data coming through for a show uh, but the, the, the lens that Barb gives us is how does that, you know, what's, how's that holistic, I guess, in terms of the devices, the demographics, so we can really start to see where that viewing is coming from. Um, I think a great recent example uh, was Your Honor, uh, which, which performed really well for us on, on Sky Atlantic. And there we could start to see through the Barb data, 
the 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 viewing growing as we uh, as we pre tx it as we put it out on box set the viewing for that pre tx really grew over time and what we can start to layer on with the barb data is who those people were in terms of their demographics and then how else did they watch um, and, and really layer up that sort of nice um, picture of complete viewing. So we use a bit of both really uh, in answer to your question. But Barb does give us the complete picture that sometimes the, the data sets themselves, whilst big data is fantastic, um, it just gives us a, a fuller picture of what's going on. And I imagine sort of given your guys' investment in things like obviously SkyQ, um, like how important is sort of the live viewing component um, going forward when obviously a lot of these these services that you're offering it is it is about on demand and, and obviously this this sort of viewership is probably increasingly important for you. Yeah, and um, and SkyQ is a is a really good example actually for for SkyQ households we've seen that. Um, because the technology is, is so great in terms of giving customers exactly what they want when they want it, etc. Uh, and, and I was really surprised to see this, but live viewing actually goes up in a, in a queue home um, before and after they, they subscribe to queue. So the technology is really enabling uh, even more viewing uh, for our customers. And um, we don't see a decline of live TV in, in queue homes, which I think is a, a fascinating finding in itself. They're just watching more of it. Um, and, and live viewing, let's face it, is here to stay. I mean, we've got some fantastic, obviously, sports, news, and we've seen that throughout COVID, that those live viewing occasions have been accelerated uh, when people want to watch those news bulletins throughout the day. Um, and interestingly, amongst younger audiences as well, that's something else that surprised us in the, in the Barb data, was how much younger demographics are really tuning into those news bulletins um, you know, whether that, that stays or not as a behaviour remains to be seen. But um, yeah, I think live viewing still has its place and will continue to do so. At the same time, we've got our eye on what we need to do for on demand um, to, to, to really make sure we're catering for all demographics through VOD in the future. Can you talk to us a little bit about the box setting strategy as well? Because you, you, know, you mentioned your honour, which I just started last week. And I mean, I can only watch two episodes barely one episode really at once because it's so stressful but I, I'm absolutely <laughs> loving it I didn't even know when exactly at TX to be honest because I just obviously I know that I can find the box set on now TV which is what I use um like can you can you talk a little bit about how this data shapes your your strategy for for box setting is everything box set at this point like in terms of released at once no I mean it depends on the rights really that we've negotiated um in terms of the strategy around box set or not um but 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 Pre-TX and box setting strategy is, it, is a really good example of where we've responded to the needs of the, the customers, of our viewers, really. And this, I guess, need to binge watch great content, which a couple of years ago just didn't exist. Viewers were content to wait uh, a week for their next uh, fix, if you like, of a great drama. But now we're seeing that, that people do need to uh, binge watch great dramas. Um, and so that's happening more and more as a behavior. So it has shaped the way we think about viewing behaviors and how that shape grows over time. Um, and your honor, I think the stat on that was 20% of, of viewers had watched the whole lot in a week, which like you, um, it's quite an intense sort of show. So, and there's 10 episodes to get through. Yeah. Um, and, and actually the Barb data is giving us great insight into um, how, that, how that's panning out in terms of viewing throughout the week. Um, and we use that to obviously inform future decisions as well on the type of shows that do really well in, in a binge watching environment. Got it. Lenore, it's just interesting this, this binging versus weekly drop though, isn't it? Because if you look at Line of Duty, which takes me seven days to recover from, so I'm quite happy that it's weekly, that's doing it nine, 10 million live. So mm -hmm. for the right content on the right channel that's got the right reach, the weekly schedule is still working and making it more of a national talking point. There's a really interesting interplay, I think, between what's still held, even Disney's doing weekly drops of apps just to keep a bit of currency and keep people coming back in. So I think that's a really interesting dynamic that we've almost moved away from the assumption everything needs to be dropped. And most things are pre-TX or post, but some things are then made to feel more special because they make you wait. 
And as a result, everyone talks about it and it's the night that you know it's on. So it's sort of redefining appointment to view. It's just quite a clever interplay, I think, at the moment. 100%, yeah. And, and it is really interesting to see sort of Disney take that route for, for The Mandalorian and, and obviously have the huge, yeah, huge buzz leading up every week, um, drawn out obviously over, over the month or whatever it is. Um, Sarah, I did actually want to ask in terms of um, in terms of your, your, the strategy at Channel 5 uh, out of the UK and, and My5, which you guys have invested quite a bit in, in terms of making that a, a platform and a bit of a destination. Um, and Wayne, I can draw you in too, because you guys obviously have a huge drama coming up later in the year with Anne Boleyn, which we're yep. so excited for. It looks fantastic. I'm loving this drip feed of, of views as well as we as we get closer to, <laughs> to the Very strategic. Very strategic. Very strategic. Um, but can you tell us, like, could we see something like Anne Boleyn? Are you going to go the, the weekly route, or would you sort of like rip up the rule book for Channel Five and see all of that box edited? Like, what's what's the strategy there? I'm absolutely not going to tell you that. <laughs> probably because we haven't probably decided yet. <laughs> I mean, Channel 5 is slightly different. So we are investing in it um, and we're very proud of the growth of My5. I mean, I can't take the credit for what I joined six months ago, but it has grown significantly in the last year, but it's definitely got a way to go. And we recognize that. And we um, also recognize you know, the whole point about this data that we're getting from Barb is to properly holistically understand what audiences want and we're pouring all over it and putting My5 much more at the heart of where Channel 5 operates such that in the end you shouldn't really have cause to care where someone watches as long as they get to the content mm. and we have a slightly older skewing audience I was Channel 4 for a long time they have undeniably led the way in um, in driving VOD viewing and they've been very public about needing to do that not least because Justin's slide showed earlier the extent to which the early adopters the younger audience which is Channel 4's heartland needs to see things on demand. Channel 5 has been able to be a bit slower than that because it's not as young skewing, but now VOD's become so mainstream that we're putting it much more front and centre of our own strategy. But Ben, in his genius um, commissioning and scheduling um, strategy, does a lot of his dramas stripped, so we always know we're never going to be the biggest in the market. So he takes four parters and he plays, he chooses a week when he knows there's no big competition against it, and it's Monday to Thursday, live linear, which does three million a night really satisfyingly when it's consolidated. We've had huge successes. Some of them have been wanes. And then by the time you get to Friday and it's the weekend, it's all available on My5 as a box set. So we're sort of riding the wave of both. It's all evolving because the audience is evolving. I mean, the connected TV stats are extraordinary, aren't they? It was all about mobile and PCs when we first started. Now it's all about the big screen. Um, the one point I would make, by the way, just to what you were saying earlier about um, just to mention Avarin's audience and you asked about how we use this data. I think that might be a little bit of a nerdy point, but it's a really important point that the easiest mistake to make, and dare I say it, quite a lot of commissioners have over the years, is to look at the Barb stats for linear and then to look at the number of streams for VOD and add them together. And you can't do that because the number of streams or the stream starts. And now Barb is measuring across the piece, you get the average audience for VOD, which you can look at. Um, in aggregate with linear and that's a really important proper understanding of the scale of viewing rather than taking a very sexy shiny big number from a mm -hmm. VOD player which can sometimes just be people, be people sampling something and then either not like it or getting interrupted that's really game changing for this thank you for making that point um Wayne did you did you have an, in terms of obviously being on the kind of production distribution side of a show like Anne Boleyn and and um do, do you have any sort of any input and in, or preference into how you would prefer that show being being rolled out uh no although I quite like what I mean it will be interesting because it's only a three-parter so it could possibly lend itself to uh scheduling stripped over a week which is which is great and and what have you well I I would say uh, that often broadcasters are not very good at talking to producers about how they're going to take their content and how they're going to play it. Actually, I, I think we it would be better for all of us actually if um, you know you still get this thing where transmission dates change dramatically and no one really knows what's quite quite going on and and you're you're informed at the very last about whether it's going to come out as a box set, whether it's going to be weekly, whether it's going to be. So I, I always think more more information is better if people. People would just keep producers particularly in the loop and help us make those decisions. Because at some stage, actually, it does make you think differently about the kind of content that, that, that you kind of make, because actually some content is absolutely right for box setting and some content works better. You know, like, you know I'm one of the 20% who, who consumed, consumed your honour in a week, but I'm also someone who's enjoying uh, line of duty once a week. And I like that mixed ecology. And I would hope we're going to continue to have that, actually, because I, I think as a consumer, you kind of like that. Um, and
and and I was I was thinking then about that that it's sort of as a viewer you you kind of if you get into that thing where there's one title you watch and you consume ten episodes in a week that's a really big commitment but afterwards you you want another one don't you which, which illustrates one of the problems that everyone is having which is tentpole content it's almost once a week you need a piece of content that you are going to go and you're really going to go and watch and uh, and when you've burnt through everything i mean last night we were struggling to find we ended up watching extras on on netflix because we watched one drama that we didn't was relatively new that we weren't particularly enjoying and it was suddenly like i want more i'm hungry i'm hungry and uh, i think that's a big that's a big problem moving forward actually we think we there's a lot of content but new content still comes at a premium mm -hmm. especially i guess i don't good times as well <clears throat> Sorry, the water cooler moment is so important. I think that's what live TV has always managed to have. It's, it's got content that people coalesce around. Everyone talks about the following day on the bus. And we have, we have nobody shows any signs of wanting to lose that. It's just that all the different players are trying to find their own version of it. So Netflix marketing campaigns for their big launches always have a date on. You know, you know when it's coming and that drive, that spikes the audience in those first weeks. So that means that everyone can talk about it. But the, but the role of live channels even if all the content on it is not live they, they they sort of refuse to die for multiple reasons but one of them is that we are as a nation like grouping around shared experience those reach charts are really impressive for esport that we saw earlier but if you put the terrestrials on there there'd be more than double in every instance because television just gets to more people in one go and it's really important not to lose sight of that esport's here to stay it's mainstream it's arguably a great addition to our cultural ecology on many levels but live, we said it already, but the extent to which the linear and live channels is reaching a broader audience and is serving more broader UK based um, uh, service to the nation is not, is not diminishing. They're just having to learn oh. to adapt their strategies. And, and just as Amazon destroyed the high street and is now thinking of opening shops, <laughs> not be surprised if some of the Esport streaming platforms eventually return to something in some ways that resembles a, a linear schedule because in well, some ways Netflix has. That's Netflix is the new channel in France. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. France is the first market in which they're they're testing out their new uh their new channel, isn't it? And that's yeah. and weirdly it's actually for, for subscribers only, I believe, which I thought was an interesting sort of play. But um just quickly, Wayne, I wanted to ask as well, in terms of in terms of viewership, how do you sort of um where are you at in terms of getting viewership information from you know, <laughs> from the streamers. Oh, I mean, broadcasters. You know, we, don't, we, we don't really. We don't really still. Sometimes on some of our shows, the creators and producers of those shows are trusted with some of the information. And, and frankly, I kind of get it. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's if you're a streaming service, your audience data and your audience knowledge is, is, is really, it's gold dust to you. And I understand why people are very protective of that. Um, um, so yeah, I think we always want to have more information, but people tend to want more information when shows don't get picked up. They, 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 they're less interested when the shows are successful and they're reordering further series, isn't it? It's about learning why things didn't really work. And in some ways I'd rather have that than knowing that the crowds watch by mm. numbers of people around the world and this is the demographic split. Although I would say what was interesting about what Justin did for me for the, the crown was, one, isn't it interesting that on a service a platform that what is in about half the, the, the households that free to air has in the UK, it's now able to reach free to air live numbers in content. And also when you looked at, if you looked at the crown audience and you, you took that audience and you put it with the BBC One audience, that they're, they're probably really similar. So that to me says actually Netflix is mainstream actually. And that then impacts when you develop a show, uh, where do you sell it? That's, that's the first thing, isn't it? You know, you develop a show and then you think, well, where am I going to take it to? Actually, in the past, I think if, if it was very expensive and big and, and um, you, you perhaps go to Netflix or you go for a big international co-production, actually, the evidence of this suggests actually things that you would take to the BBC or ITV that you thought were quite domestic, actually, you would take to Netflix and and in some ways, we, we had a bit of a taste of that quite recently with a show called Behind Her Eyes, which actually could have been a show that, that could have played on ITV and, 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 and the BBC. It went for Netflix. And I think it surprised us all by becoming 
such a big success for Netflix, actually. And I know that Anne would like more kinds of shows like that. So I think that information that Justin gave, gave me a thing to think, well, the new mainstream is, is, is Netflix and, and Amazon and so on. Justin, I mean, you, you mentioned um, earlier in, in your presentation, I thought that was quite interesting how your conversation with, with Amazon um, sort of went cold around, um, around the grand tour when obviously you made it clear that this data would be would be shared with the rest of your subscribers as well. Um, I mean, presumably that was that was some time ago. Maybe you can kind of clarify for us. But I mean, how have those conversations moved in a in a more positive sort of direction? Um, I mean, obviously, I wanted to kind of mention the the DCMS committee inquiry as well. The results of which I believe it was last month. Feels like an eternity ago, but um, last month they said that you know broadcasters should share, sorry, streamers should share their top line viewing data for broadcast content. Um, is that is that realistic? Um, sorry, that's a two prong question, I guess. First, in terms of SVOD, yeah, yeah. um, play in. Um, I, I mean, we, we we were very excited about the data that we're in the final stages of due diligence on prior to the launch towards the end of the summer, and we'd be delighted to have relationships with the streamers that are equivalent to the collaborative relationships that we have with broadcasters. And I don't, I don't want to really get into a public running commentary about. The detail of the conversations we're having with the streamers but we we are in live conversations with a couple and hope to open up a third conversation coming weeks and i've talked a little bit about the informal uh technical input we had which was helpful last year from from netflix i mean i think the streamers um uh, naturally need to consider the value of our data alongside their own in-house data and Wayne's pointed out the, the value that they that they hold in their own in-house streaming data um, I, I suspect it's probably a similar conversation to the one the broadcasters have and I thought Lucy did a great job of bringing to life how Barb can work alongside big data sources and that that would certainly be a point that we would be making in in the conversations we have with these streaming companies because we we do believe we uh, we'll be delivering genuine insight on, on top of in-house streaming data, whether it be adding colour in terms of how many people are watching at a given moment in time, what type of people they are, but, but also that competitive insight. And, and as the SVOD streaming um, part of the, the industry gets more competitive, I would, I would guess that sort of competitive insight will become ever more valuable. But I think the, the interesting part of your question, Minori, is Barb has, data has three core purposes, one of which is to help um, broadcasters and production companies make and distribute great programs and, and other purposes to provide an advertising trading currency. But to your point, our data, the third purpose for our data is informing the public debate about how media services are, are fulfilling public service requirements, regulatory requirements. And, and, and our data are a very important part of that conversation. And um, so uh, we, we do intend to be making these data available uh, later in the year. We, as I said at the outset, we'd love the streamers to be um, more closely involved. Um, but, but as I say, I'm not going to get into a detailed live running commentary about where we are with each of them. Sure. Can I just make the, make the obvious point that we just mustn't lose sight of that these services are wonderful, they'll create some great content, but Amazon is not a content player. Amazon is a logistics and delivery player who has a TV service to get people to have free deliveries. And so I'm sure they want to know how the Grand Tour was doing, but I think their, their vested interests in properly sharing data and understanding UK audiences are coming from a completely different place than most of the yeah. bar writers. Yeah, and that's coming through in some of our conversations. These organizations have different key performance metrics for their VOD services and there's nothing Barb can do to change what those key performance metrics are but but we do think we can add value when they are interested in understanding the audience element of what they're doing yeah just a question for the that was, that was an interesting spike wasn't it the Premier League spike for Amazon you know it's interesting you know today when some of us are despairing about the game we love and thinking well someone must be funding European Super League and it's going to be broadcasters. Well, who's got the who's got the budgets to do that, actually, which is something that no one seems to have talked about at the moment. Presumably, if they're going to start from August, someone's got to pay for it. You're Amazon, you're looking at that and you think, 
you know, it's going to deliver you people who are going to keep with Amazon Prime for the years. You you might well be the people behind it. You know, I mean, I, it's it's interesting to know who they're talking to this European Super League. Uh, it's all something about Google, YouTube. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, this is not my forte, by the way. I'm not going to be pulled into football chat, Wayne. <laughs> however, however, it or is. Or no we're going to call it soon soccer ball. Yeah. Soccer ball. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it's a completely legitimate, and we did see those spikes very clearly in um, in December. Um, just in terms of the DCMS question um, for the rest of the panelists as well, um, do you do you feel as though it's realistic to expect some some give in terms of you know on the streamers' part going going forward, especially you know as they're investing, they're they're sort of plugging top talent in terms of commissioning, they're um, you know they're they're investing very heavily into local content. Could could we see them kind of Meet, meet broadcasters halfway on that point. The DCMS um, recommendation was public service broadcasters, wasn't it? And I, I never need any encouragement to wave my public service pom pom because I just think it's incredibly important for the fabric of our cultural existence in the UK. And um, so the, the prominence debate, which I think belongs to a different RTS panel about the need to make sure that we, the public service broadcasters don't slip out of sight and the global tech players who all own these big screen TVs that we're watching on. That is another panel, but it's an incredibly important point. And one of the reasons it's so important is you have to make sure that public service providers make impact on the very public they're there to serve, namely the UK viewing population. So you have to understand what that impact is and any further visibility of what public service programming on the SVOD players is doing can only be welcome, particularly for the BBC that doesn't have a monetization model and needs to prove its impact to justify the license fee, but for all of us. I mean, the good thing for the bar from my point of view is having worked on VOD service ever since VOD launched over 15 years ago, is I've always known on every da daily basis what my own service has done because I get the overnights in the VOD equivalent. And I know from the first party data what the relativity of that is to what Barb tells me my linear performance is. But I've never been able to look at across the market as before to understand the holistic performance. So that's what this now enables us to do, to see how other equivalents are playing. Um, and it will give us some insight into public service content. But if making the streamers report differently, communicate differently and understand the importance of differently public service content then that's only to be welcomed lucy did you did you want to sort of weigh in as well yeah i just um sort of thinking about it really in terms of trans the question around transparency and um you know it is better if if things are measured in a consistent way ultimately if measurement for any media is measured in a consistent way so we've got we're comparing apples with apples we're not we're not comparing an incomplete stream with 10, 10 minutes of viewing a program so i can see both sides uh, to the argument to be honest um but i i do think when it comes down to we're not marking our own homework um and provided trusted verified measurement of some description um, it is probably a better thing for the whole industry. Whether, you know, the, the granularity of that measurement can be debated, but at some level, there needs to be an overview in terms of a trusted industry metric that's been verified and, and independently audited. Otherwise, we're all tying ourselves up in knots over what does this mean? What does that mean? Is that a real view or not? Is that a real impression? Um, so I guess it's, it's it's a welcome view, really, if we can get there. Love it. I just quickly wanted to ask as well, like in terms of in terms of some of the vertical integration, obviously that we're seeing on the studio side, especially with with you know as they as they expand sort of these streamers internationally. How does that then affect the content that you guys have in terms of you know some of the older sort of shows that obviously are huge are still obviously there's a new programming that is that is very much a draw, but some of the old catalog fare that kind of powers some of these on-demand uh, platforms among the broadcasters as well. Like where, what are, what are your thoughts on, on those Sarah and, and Lucy in terms of, I guess the investment that you'll continue to, to give that side of things? Well, I think, I can't speak for Channel 4, I don't work there anymore, but I think they have frequently talked on public platforms about seeing some, if it's worked properly, a flywheel effect that really benefits them. So some of the archive titles of an example that we always used to talk about was Friday Night Dinner, such a massive success for Channel 4, homegrown by Channel 4, but licensed to Netflix with the archive series, which introduced it to a wider audience, gave, made it noisier. Um, it, it got caught in, in Netflix algorithm because it's a brilliant series and it found its, its deserved popularity, such that when Channel 4 then had the new series, 
the audience came in in their droves. So it, it can, that, that back catalog being used to drive the returning series or the premieres or the latest versions of, can be a really beneficial sort of synergistic relationship, just as CoPros can. I mean, it's getting increasingly expensive to make the sort of television that some broadcasters want to in just one market and doing a CoPro with a streamer who'll fund it globally enables content to get made in the first place. So I, there, there's definitely a complex frenemy relationship between the two. Um, the back catalog can do a really good job to drive viewers to latest content and that that's to be welcomed. The, the good thing as well though of course is that all of these players, not least all four and now my five, is, get, is getting better at exploiting their own back catalog. So you, you're not as reliant on the global player, you can actually, you've got enough traction with your own service to keep that audience rotating. And Lucy as well obviously with um, in terms of HBO Max kind of looking to launch in Europe later this year. I know obviously there's still a few more years to, to run out in terms of that Sky Output deal, but um, obviously it, it will run out at some point. And, and clearly you guys are kind of creating a little arsenal of your own in terms of your original content. Um, is the hope that you will then sort of, is there like a strategy in terms of promoting those originals as, as some of that kind of HBO Showtime content falls away? Yeah, and that's, that's that's definitely one of the the key strategies in terms of, like you say, growing those Sky originals and also pushing into other genres. Mm. Historically, you know, we've just thought about it as, as drama content, but now increasingly documentaries, movies um, it, are emerging genres that are doing really well for us kids as well. Um, I just want to make a... Um, add to Sarah's point really is a really nice example that I love on the kind of mutually beneficial relationship when and, and I love the friends example where friends was a, a series that that I grew up with my teens 20s um, and I love that and then it kind of went away for a while and now it's had a resurgence um, because it was it was played out again in the US and I love that because a whole new audiences are coming into friends that have never seen it before um, and as a result of that, you know, we've got a great example there of an old favourite that's that's coming back and finding new audiences from different platforms and different broadcasters. So um, I think it can work both ways, really. Yeah, we have friends on Comedy Central um, and watched it grow on Netflix. And that's another reason for us to need to understand it, because you want to understand, again, the interplay between the two. But I think you can identify the lean forward experience of actively seeking episodes you want and the lean back experience of just having it fed to you, you know, in a, in a, in a schedule that's stacked and both find their audience. Sure. Okay. Um, we have got a few questions here that have come in, so I will go through these. Um, the last sort of 10 minutes that we've got. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay. Uh, someone was asking about, uh, what about the audience's privacy? How are you, how are you managing this? Um, Justin, I'm assuming that's in terms of in terms of um, Barb and your and your kind of measurements. Sure. I mean, I mean so at the core of our audience uh, measurement services is a panel of homes that is um, uh, recruited through uh, random methods to ensure that we're getting as uh, good a um, profile of the. Uh, breadth of society as we possibly can and w whenever we recruit a home onto the panel we um, clearly ensure that, uh, that they're aware that um, all, all their data is is handled um, within all of the appropriate um, data privacy regulations and guidelines um, it's not possible for any of our data users to identify individual panel homes um, and not not even me working at Barb. I, I'm not allowed to know who's on who's on the Barb panel. Only our research contractors are allowed to know that. So there's there's very very high levels of of, of security around ensuring the anonymity of, of the panel homes. And, and naturally, we do everything we can to to reassure that um, those homes on the panel that their data are being handled, uh, as I say, within all the appropriate guidelines. So, I mean, these these are um absolutely sacrosanct to us we we, we can't in, in any way uh risk um panel members becoming known to the, the media services that we're measuring and, and similarly we, we we can't afford to have a, a privacy breach on our hands so we we treat privacy with the um ut utmost uh, utmost seriousness got it okay thank, thank you justin um and just to clarify the the panel is a group of five five thousand plus households right is that correct that's right yeah so we 
just got over 5,000 homes. Um, and it's, uh, it, we, we use the official government uh, statistics from the census to set our targets for how many homes of different types that we have on the panel, whether it be homes by uh, demography. Um, we, we also use the official government stats on homes within um, ethnic communities so we can make sure that we've got ethnic communities properly represented on the panel. And, um, and we're constantly looking at the, the balance of the panel to make sure that it is as representative as it can be of all the different parts of, of our society. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so there's another question here from Colin Ward. What can we, and this is a question for the whole panel, what can we learn from the children's uh, audience viewing figures in terms of their engagement with streamers? Are they the canary in the coal mine? And this might be off topic, but what might that data tell Ofcom and the government with respect to the review into the future of public service media? Well, I was just going to throw out a thought, which is, is the problem that the problem that the free-to-air broadcasters face is that they're still having to manage and commission for linear schedules in a world of uh, digital schedules. And it's sort of slightly unfair, really. And the sooner uh, people like Sarah and her team can have a fully, a full uh, digital service, I think, I think it'd be better because I think they'll, they'll be able to put money into, into content without having to service the whole of a schedule, which seems now increasingly old fashioned. There you go, that's a talking point. There, therein lies the tenets of public broadcasting, <laughs> what it's there to do, which is invest in content that doesn't always make money, but that is important is made, that the streamers aren't going to go to. News services do not make money, but they are really important to look at the last year, look at the young audiences that we saw coming into them on live, linear television. So I'm, I'm all for having freedom, Wayne, but I'm not sure if I'd go that far. Well, no, I'm not saying that you do. There's lots of stuff in the schedule that is just filler. We all know that. I don't know if it is, and, and actually, uh, one, one of the things we've realised with the streaming services is that the archive is really, really rich, actually, and, and, and so use yeah. the archive more. That's, that's where the real, if you look at the streaming services, most of their viewing comes from archive programming, acquired programming. It's not from originals. Acquired, often originated by the very broadcasters that we're talking about. And, you know, that's true, and, and lots of international content that's made at a far lower price point. Uh, the audience is now much more interested in tasting content with different languages and, and so on. I mean, it's definitely true that the public service broadcasters should increasingly be allowed to show what they're doing across digital as well as linear, no question. Otherwise, there's no incentive for us to invest in digital with, from that sort of spectrum. There's lots of factors in play here. Monetization needs to catch up. We need to be certain that there'll be enough money to sustain the, in the ad funded world mm -hmm. when it's free bod um, and we have a to the kids question one five we have milkshake which is a preschool block um, which we, we don't have I mean we choose to have we're delighted to have it it does really well for us it brings a lovely audience into the daytime and it gives us a really really good point of differentiation differentiation against the other commercial free broadcasters so um, it's, it's, it's the, the world I don't quite know how to answer the what children are doing with SBOD other than that um, the more money that goes in to create UK, UK originated children's programming, the, the more the the, the, um, the more they will find what they need, and we'll keep them in our um, getting the right sort of content for them to view. Um, Brilliant, thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, I think we will actually move on to question two from the audience. Presumably, new technology can't measure audience appreciation. Is this still done? If so, is it by survey? Tracker, survey, focus group. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Because um, technology is improving and there are techniques out there and solutions and capabilities that can actually give us a view of appreciation now, uh, whether that's eye tracking on the, on the TV, cameras on the TV, eye tracking on the TV. And I think a lot of these, um, and there's a great example of actually TV, T-Vision in the, in the US that had a good go at this. And I think we'll increasingly see more um, technology coming our way to enable us to measure appreciation and attention of content and ads. Um, so we can move away from surveys and claimed uh, behavior. So I think that's a really nice innovation that we, that we can look out for. Um, and, and there's gonna be lots of different ways of, of doing that, that technology is going to enable for us. 
I remember at Sky a long time ago, we, um, we tried to measure it through button pushing, the green button, I think it was at the time, probably mm-hmm. 10, 10, 15 years ago, maybe more. Um, and we found that, that that didn't really work for us. So uh, it's going to have to be a passive measurement, whatever we do in the mm-hmm. future. Got it. Okay. Um, this is a question for Justin and possibly the wider panel. Do they feel, do you feel that the traditional Nielsen methodology gives an accurate reading of engagement and whether the audience are actual actually watching, um, have the set on or have the set on in the background and are doing something else? Or is there emotional engagement in the same way we see the participants of Gogglebox? <laughs> So actually this builds a little bit on what Lucy's just talked about, about how you measure attention, which is, um, attention's a really difficult thing to, to, to measure. Um, you could have two people in front of a telly, one staring resolutely at the screen, but thinking about a bad day at work and another looking at their iPad, doing the Times crossword and struggling with four across and listening to the TV and which, which one is paying more attention. It's actually fiendishly difficult to, to measure engagement and attention. And what Barb does working with, and we work with Kantar and then Nielsen is the provider of the equivalent rating service in the US. Um, we, we focus on measuring presence in room and, and that is a, a metric that's difficult to argue with. Um, in terms of additional uh, engagement metrics, I think that's far better suited to ad hoc type studies, the, the kind of which the, um, Sarah and Lucy have just referred to. It's, it, it's fiendishly difficult to get an engagement attention measure into an ongoing daily um, audience reporting system. And just a final question as well for you um, from Matthew Moore. Um, Question for Justin, does the new method involve audio matching as is the case for broadcast readings uh, or do the Wi-Fi meters detect something other than audio? Just a question about the methodology for the new system, which I believe is correct. Sure. So um, we, we use the router meter um, to get overall levels of viewing to a service and we use audio matching to get the content ratings. So um, audio matching, if you're not familiar with it, it's it's a bit like the Shazam service. If you ever use Shazam, you kind of hold your phone up and it takes a sample of the audio it hears and turns it into a digital signature and compares it to a huge reference library of, of music. We, we use a similar technique. So the, the content ratings um, to, to Matthew's question, they're generated using audio matching, but the overall viewing levels come from the root meter identifying which URLs are feeding content to which device. Thank you so much. Um, right, I think we are we are at two o'clock now, um, so I will end the session here. But I just wanted to give a big thank you to our amazing panelists, um, Sarah, Wayne, Lucy, and uh, Justin. Thank you so much for your time and for your great presentation. And yes, we shall see how this evolves, specifically um, in regards to government involvement and uh, and where things go from here. But in the meantime, um, yeah, thank you very much for everyone for joining us. <laughs>